Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, which as you can see is on understanding the management of information and knowledge of facilities management. Uh, so firstly, welcome, as I've said, and I just want to go over a few bits of housekeeping before we start the official um, presentation. So if I can ask for the next slide to come over. So those that are new, um, this is your control panel, which you should see on your right hand side. Uh, you can control um, how you want to hear it. So you can either do it through your computer speakers or through the telephone. Um, we are going to have a couple of uh, sections where we want it to be interactive and we want your um, answers. So for that, uh, please use that questions box as well as to send through any general comments you have or um, actual questions on the presentation. Uh, you'd also notice as well on your control panel a handout section. For that, you can download the slides uh, from today's presentation and take that away with you. Um, but we will be circulating that after along with the recording. Uh, so if we go to the next one, please. So if anyone did want further information on this topic, uh, anyone that's new or currently a member, you'll know um, we've got a host of information all on our site. Uh, one area to look at is the good practice guides. Um, examples can be selecting FM software, uh, BEMS, which is building energy management systems, and also uh, FM and BIM projects. Also, we do have um, recorded webinars we've done in the past, as well as new ones coming up. Um, an example can be uh, the three-part series we did on BIM. So if anyone does want further information, uh, the link to our knowledge section is right at the bottom there. So next, I'll go and introduce the present presenter for today. So presenting is Mal Ashall. Um, Mal works as a senior lecturer at the School of Built Environment at Liverpool John Moores University. He also works with BIFM as an external quality assurer and an assessor for the BIFM qualifications. So his background is um, both in an academic sense um, immersed in facilities management, but he also comes from an experienced background where he's worked in it and he's managed his own business and successfully sold that off as well. Uh, so without further ado, um, Mal, uh, over to you. Well, thanks, Nicole. Didn't recognise myself on that introduction as well, so that was rather nice. And I actually didn't recognise myself from the photograph either, so uh, must be must be an old one. I look a bit uh, look a bit older than that nowadays. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. I hope you are uh, looking forward to the next hour, where we're going to cover off some information really about knowledge and information within facilities management. I didn't really want to make the whole process about different types of IC systems because that's not really what this is, is about. It's just, you know, you can pick those and you can get those designed to what you want, but also to understand how they can influence what you do and how they can help you manage facilities better. So the the brief that I've been given is the learning outcomes uh, stated there. So BFM have asked me to, to cover how to collate data within a facilities management context, how to analyze data, uh, how to understand how to use information effectively, how to manage information and knowledge the information flow within the current legislation. So that will be heavily based on the UK. Uh, so apologies to anybody that's listening in from another country and understand the types of IT systems. So we won't be going through uh, particular brand names, but we will be talking about some of the things that could help you. Uh, for those of you who've listened to my presentations before, you know that I always like to start off with this, why do FM look after building? And usually I highlight in red the area that I think today's discussion is going to cover. And this is probably one of the first times where all four aspects of why FMs look after buildings have actually been in red. So this shows you what a big topic this is and how important it is that we, uh, we have some understanding of what's going on. The second slide that always appears is how do FMs look after buildings? And again, this is probably the first time that all five of those have all been in red. So again, just to underline the whys and the hows, this is an important aspect of what you're going to do. It's important then to have a clear understanding of what it is we're going to talk about. So I've put there some definitions of the of the word. So we've got knowledge, we've got information, and we've got management. So if we look up the Oxford Dictionary, which is the source that I've used, 
knowledge is facts it, it's information and skills acquired through experience or education or it could be experience and education so the theoretical or practical understanding of a subject so that's pretty key to what we're going to focus on moving forward and then we've got information so facts provided or learned about something or someone or what is conveyed or represented by a particular arrangement or sequence of things and management is the process of dealing with or controlling things or people so we're probably all familiar with the expression the internet of things we probably in buildings anywhere we work now we've got lots and lots of sensors we've got all kinds of data and information that are actually being provided by where we work who we work for and sometimes we could literally say that we're we're information or data rich and knowledge poor because it's the turning of that information into something we can actually do something with that's probably the key point to this and hopefully the case study will be a bit of discussion on how that might be applicable so information information in organizations as you can see it's a key aspect of management is information so everything in the workplace now revolves around the production of information in fact you'll have probably worked in organizations where people's sole job is the production and consolidation of information to go further up the food chain for management to make decisions which is quite a change in the working life probably over the last 15 to 20 years how that has has moved and that's how organizations then can make rules about how they want to work but also make robust decisions and also if we think about we've talked before in previous webinars about deming cycles you know that plan do check act kind of process of continuous improvement information enables you to do that and the knowledge that comes from that information enables you to see whether you've actually achieved what you set out to achieve and whether you need to redress and alter that process so that's in an organization it then kind of filters down really into issues within fm and if you think about it FM over the last few years lots of management information has been introduced to look at performance management the improvements of the business actually optimizing all the resources and also to, to take in the, the broad church that now is statutory reporting that covers lots and lots of different topics now there's a kind of a generalized question here is, is is can we manage what we cannot measure um, I, I'm a firm believer that, that we can't. In order to, to manage, you need information, you need knowledge, you need to have the ability to make robust decisions based on uh, past performance and future expectations by extrapolating information and seeing how that could change or alter the way that you do things. Um, that's a different thing to leadership and having a, a long-term vision and everything and, and you know that's been probably discussed in other parts of your learning so the huge point of this is we need information and we need to have knowledge from that information to make our business our fm part of the business successful so then just the general question to throw out to you and i hope you all embrace the question why do we need to manage and i'd just be interested to know what your thoughts are on that okay so um a bit of a warm-up for everyone uh, if you want to send your answers through that questions box uh, we can then go through and start listening and, and towards mail and also the rest of the audience so i can see a few of you are typing so i'll just give you a few you can see that, can you, Nicole? I can't see that. So, yeah, I can see names appearing now as well. So, uh, Dan's come back and said, "If we don't manage, we fail." <laughs> True. Yeah, very, very much so. Uh, Deborah has said about continual improvement. Yeah, I'll go along with that one as well. Uh, Gary's come in and said, manage to control input and output actions with the aim of improving business or organisation. Uh, you have to read that one to me again, won't you? That sounded, that sounded excellent. Uh, that was Gary, that was. And it yeah, was, uh, manage to control input and output actions with the aim of improving business or organisation. 
I've also mm -hmm. had Charles come in and says uh, building scrines will hold otherwise. They do. Uh, Sam said about preventing problems. Yeah. Uh, Julian's come in and said about effective and efficient control of resources. Effective and efficient. I like that. The buzzwords, is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, buzzwords. Yeah, two of my favourite buzzwords. Whether to be, whether it is better to be effective or efficient, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Andrew's come in and said about achieving um, organisations' objectives. Yeah. Let's go through more. Uh, Joe said about we need to ensure what's going on to prevent chaos and to assist business decisions in on the way forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and Steve, it's, 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 oh, go on, sorry. Uh, last one, I'd say. Uh, Steve is um, saying about controlling costs. Controlling costs, yeah. And right, what? what so some of the slides that we've got coming up next, we'll we'll talk about you know what you need to manage. But certainly in this point, yeah, the first one was if you, if you don't manage stuff, then you 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 probably going to fail in what you do that that's um very very relevant and very very true i, I like the point about continuous uh, the thing the theme that's kind of coming to me is is this continuous change continuous improvement constantly developing and i i, I always love anything about effective and efficiency i always think that's a good thing to can talk about and i like the the old, in, in order to achieve organizational objectives i think one of one of the, the big things about uh, information is to actually go up another level than that and is to actually set the objectives that we're going to try and achieve so that, that might be one thing that we might want to use information and manage it for so if we think about managing there really really a, a, a wide pot but all sort of all positive things apart from the last one controlling costs isn't it which is kind of just a given isn't it i think in that we do it but everybody's like thinking that management is a real positive step forward into making a difference within a business and actually improving it which brings me back to that whether it's better to be effective or efficient isn't it is it better to do the right things or do things right and a lot you can depend on where you're working in the business but also your personality but I can't ask everybody to put the hand up on this one, but if, if we were in a room, I'd probably say, I'd be raising my hand saying, I think it's better to do the the right thing, so be effective, than it is to do things right, which is being about efficient. I think you do need an, an element of being efficient. It's certainly important, but it's more important to focus your attention on doing the right things. And when we come on to, and that's part of the process as well, is deciding what are the right things. That's what we need to find out at the end of this. We can collect lots and lots of information, but if it doesn't help us do the right things, then are we really collecting it for the right reasons? Right. So what do we need to manage? I don't want to read everything off all these slides, but as you can see, uh, cost cutting was mentioned and finance, financial information provides us with the information that we can manage. So we need to know about what rent, what rates, what service charges, all the things that go together to make financial information useful. Now, some of you have probably studied finance uh, for FMs as well. And there's really two elements to finance, isn't it? There's what we call finance, which is the the information that we provide to shareholders, to the uh, HMRC, so very much focused on profit and loss. So profit and loss is a, a, a historical view over a set period of time as to how the company's performed. And then we look at the balance sheet, which is how the company's performing. It's a photograph on a given day. And then we'd have the future, which be would be the forecasting and projected spends, isn't it? And it's using historical information as you've all just told me there to take the business forward isn't it to 
project costs to what we think we're going to need over the next one year, five years, 10 years, whatever, how we can take those forward. So financial information is hugely, hugely important from an organizational point of view. And that's why accountants get paid so much money. And that's why there's so many of them in every business, isn't there? Probably in every business, the accountants will outnumber the FM person by quite a lot. Although the FM person will be spending a lot of that money. I think we also need to have an understanding of supply chain. We need to know, we have information on what the service is and what the geographical coverage is. How are we going to rate the performance scores within a contract? What are we going to do with that when we've got it? Do we use it to change contractor, compare, contrast, benchmark? How do our health and safety records compare? Do we compare them with last month, last year? Do we compare them with other parts of our business? Do we compare them with other companies? Lots of different things to think about there. We can think about the turnover and profit margins of our companies that we deal with. I think if you think about it, if, if you look at your own supply chain, do you look at the financial accounts of companies that you're gonna do business with? I tend to do, I tend to look at the number of employees that they, they would have. I'd look at their financial records. I want a company that, isn't necessarily a phoenix, goes bust one year, reinvents itself and starts again. I don't like them to be a huge organization usually. I'd like me to be, you know, one of their top five customers so that if I need to get hold of somebody at three o'clock in the morning, I can do. I can leverage things to get things done. So it's understanding that. I do need to know what their insurance cover is and I need to know the expertise of the people that are going to be coming and doing work on my premises or doing all work on other people's premises for me. So there's a lot of information we need to know if we're going to successfully manage our supply chain. Sometimes the problem is we might have a lot of this information, but it's where do we store it, how do we store it, and how do we get access to it? Every business will say to you that their most important asset is their people, and it's 100% true, isn't it? No people really generally no business but we do need to know about information about employees we need to know where they work some companies like to know how long it takes people to travel to work we also need to know about rec recruitment trends and space needs particularly in fm we need to know the demographic of the people that are going to be working for us and that becomes more important again with the ability of having sort of four generations of people in the workplace all really wanting to work in different uh, styles. We know there's a difference in how men and women work and how they like to work. So do we create an office that uh, replicates that? So information we can use there. We can also look at does the environment that we're providing for people to come to work, is it affecting our ability to attract staff? Is it affecting our ability to retain staff? what's happening with that so we can use lots and lots of information to see how we perform as an FM team with regards to having an input in how human resources is managed and looked after within our organization. Another one of the key areas is obviously environmental information and the case study that we're going to have a look at a little bit later does focus on that and I would probably say if you were working as an FM today uh, you'd be spending a lot of your time looking at utilities consumption. You'd be trying to work out what the carbon footprint is, analyzing how much waste is produced, how much is recycled, what type of waste it is, and looking at sort of energy management systems as well. And I think as well, part of the process will be, again, using information to project forward about what you think your energy usage and any extra environmental measures you need to put in that then flips back to human resources as well doesn't it because if you think about it it's usually humans that have a major effect in the utility consumption or the environmental performance within an organization so we can was it peter drucker said you know you can you can easily change a strategy but you can't it's very difficult to change culture and if you focus on changing culture you'll have greater business success so that can be something that we need to link these two items to hr information and environmental information to improve matters within that probably one of the most 
important areas we'll focus on as well is our estates information. So what's the property value? If we think about it right at the very start, we said, why do FMs look after buildings? To make sure that the company's asset doesn't decrease in value. So we need to know what its value is and we need to know it probably every year for our accounts. So that then flips that same information that you're using will go back into the financial system as well. We also need to know the portfolio size so we can work out how many people we need to help manage the uh, the portfolio, how many people uh, that we contracts. Also, is it the right size for the number of occupants? Do we need more space? Do we need less space? Are we having a program of reduction? And can we save money doing that in order to undertake a program of reduction we need to understand which of our buildings we can let go at various times and how does that fit into our strategy so we need to know the lease terms we need to know some of the conditions of the lease we might have one building that uh, we might be paying a slightly less rent on than another one but the repair covenants in the lease might be more onerous so it might actually cost us more money to leave that lease than the one that we're paying slightly less rent on. So do we make a decision based just on on the actual rent paid or what it's actually going to cost us to leave and or occupy that building in the longer term? Estate investors, I mentioned there about contractors. Uh, what are the contractors? What do they do? What assets do they look after? How do we pay them? How do we check that they've done the work that they say they've done? All these matters need to be managed and controlled. And then we've got space and building utilization to consider and then occupancy, the profile and the tenancy. So that kind of leads us on then to maintenance of operations. So this information will, prov we, we have information on this and it will then provide us information on how many of these staff we need. So how, what are our facility staff? What are the hours of operation? The hours of operation and the shifts might not actually be relevant to, to what we need. So we might use the information to make changes there. Hugely important information is, is the asset and service performance. So how long have we had the asset? How long is it warranted for? How long do we expect it to last? At what point in the life cycle of it do we expect to make key expenditure changes with regards to ma uh, maintenance? At what time do we, uh, in the process do we expect to replace it? At what level are we depreciating it? Again, that would trip back into your finance side of the business. So lots of things going on there. Maintenance schedules, so we've got their reactive plan preventive. So how often are we going to put together a plan preventive maintenance? Are we going to do every five years? Is our, our business so complex that we need it every year? All those things. And then if we're doing everything right, then we should get some customer service. We might get and experience scores of what people think is happening within our organization. So tremendous amount of information goes into maintenance operations and we need to be able to use that to inform our decisions and make changes where necessary to improve the process. So basically everything you all said earlier on about why do we, why do we need to manage. So IT, as you can appreciate now, it's 2017 I'm unfortunately old enough I remember when the internet first started to come into our working lives and the difference it made a uh, hugely significant way of transporting information holding information and, and allowing a business to change rapidly for good to change rapidly in a situation of economic decline and change rapidly when it needs to expand and move forward and it's kind of We've got to think about IT in business demonstrates performance and profit. So there's that one side to it. And there's also the side kind of where people in FM sit, isn't there? So the people that are supporting the core function and creating a better work environment. Now, that's quite difficult to quantify, isn't it? And it often leads us to being very much driven on saving costs, isn't it? So we are we have been in a recession for a long period of time we've been coming out of it probably for the last couple of years but there's still probably i would imagine most people's day jobs is very much focused on the cost of space the cost of running the facility perhaps the cost of its acquiring space the cost of any disposals and probably more importantly on an operational day-to-day -day level the cost of complying with legislation 
It's usually hugely important task. I think when you talk to people that sort of work outside FM and the built environment, they always think that an empty building doesn't cost any money, whereas an empty building does cost money to run, doesn't it? It still has to be dependent, and particularly if you're planning on reopening an empty building in 12 or 24 months' time, a lot of statutory compliance still needs to take place even when it's not an occupation. Obviously, as soon as we put the human element in, that ramps up significantly. And then we need IT to manage all of the above, and that's always a tricky thing, and I'm sure everybody's got experience, and certainly my experience is you'd have one system to manage health and safety, one system to manage asbestos, one system to manage fire. In most organizations, a lot of software is bolted on, and it's not linked together, and it's not modular in the way that you can do things. And if everything was kind of in one place, you could look after your lease details, you could look after your contractor information and your, and your payments of contractor systems, you could look after all your compliance information all in one place, then that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? And it would make life a lot easier for the storing of information, but also the using the information and compiling the information into knowledge to be used would be so much easier. So again, FM objectives within the organization is, and we're going to use IT to do it, is to reduce the, the cost of the real estate, assist the core business in using real estate to achieve as much profit as possible. And I think that's, again, something we often forget, isn't it? A lot of businesses are property reliant in order to undertake their task. I work at a university. We, unless we completely shift to distance learning, the buildings are absolutely essential to provide in the student experience. That's it in a nutshell. If you go on our website, you see a picture of a couple of people and you usually see a building. So real estate, if you think about retail shops, yeah, a lot of shops now have a clicks business, but they're still very much bricks, aren't they? It's bricks and clicks. Most people have both sides. And I think I read somewhere a few years ago, wasn't it? Sort of 70% of purchases made in shops now are actually made by people who've who've looked at the product they want online and then gone to a shop. So armed with that information and armed with that knowledge, you can make decisions then if you're a retail business about what amount of retail space you need to hold. So if if you think about going into a fashion outlet, a lot of space is taken up with storing clothing but also displaying the clothing and, and kind of mannequins. Well, if people are going onto the internet to view it first and you put together ideas of you know, a bag to go with it or a scarf to go with it and have somebody wearing it, but all that space doesn't need to be used anymore. And so it can be used to hold more space and you can use the internet to promote items that people will then go in store to purchase. So there's a lot of things that can be done there in how FM can manage space due to information from other parts of the business. We also want to use IT to reduce risk to the organization. So again, as mentioned, we need to be thinking about deleterious and hazardous materials of so the management of asbestos, isn't it? We'll probably be online. We need to think about fire, where the information is on that. How do we manage that? How do we record that we've managed it as well? We'll also be stored in that system. So lots of things going on there. And then if we think about it, then the IT that was give us the information is split into two sorts of roles managing the buildings themselves and then managing the interface between the buildings and the people and the processes that interact with them so that's a key distinction between the two isn't it and so what we'll do is we'll have a little chat now about managing the buildings so nicole mentioned earlier didn't she building energy management system which is a kind of a a more modern expression to the building management system which has largely looked at um, heating cooling lighting information on it we can also have facilities and property management systems so no adverts for particular ones here but you can have property management systems caffeine systems 
there's BIM as well and the, the, the relationship between taking over a new building that's been designed in BIM or, or taking back a building that's been refurbed using uh, BIM as the uh, design mechanism. Obviously then uh, we can use a COBE which is uh, Constructions Operations Building Information Exchange so that then takes the BIM data and transports it into the CAFM system which makes that handover phase of taking over a new building extremely relevant and easy than it used to be I don't know my experience in that is you know somebody turning up with a, a load of discs and files and a load of O&M manuals in a shopping trolley and you've got it's Friday afternoon and you've got to work out how to do the fire alarm drill for Tuesday morning with all the information handed to you. It usually takes six months to get that information into your systems and to have the property working in a realistic way. So you think if you've spent millions of pounds on having a property built and it takes you six months before you're as a team fully functioning, then you can see the benefit in BIM just from the ongoing operational side of the building. We need then to think about managing the interfaces between the people in the buildings and, and managing how the building is used. One of the major things you will probably find if you've any experience at looking at energy and energy management is that the expectation, um, sorry I'll re rephrase that, the energy that you expect to use often if you've had a new building built or you've done some work on it, um, the amount you use is always greatly exceeds the predicted amount. So I don't know if you know too much about part L of the building regs, which provides you with a, a notional building on which EPCs and other data is based. And that sort of explains roughly how your building should before, perform if it is a notional office with a notional set number of people in. When it comes to the reality, that never maps out the same. Now, the Australians have a really good system called Neighbours. I always think it's funny that the Australians have a, an energy system called Neighbours, but mainly because I used to watch Neighbours in the 80s. But this is spelled N-A-B-E-R-S, which gives you information about what the notional building should perform at. And then it looks at the, the real information as well and compares and contrasts the two. Now, the important thing about that is that the only element that's differed there is the human beings in the building. So the human beings, the people doing something different than was originally conceived in the design. And that's often what happens, isn't it? So I have um, an example where information we receive. So I, I'm a governor of a school. I received information on uh, every cost that had taken place in that school over the past 12 months and when we looked at them and uh, another lady was on the governor's with me and she was an accountant and she said why are we paying the caretakers so much overtime so when we broke it down we were paying the caretaker overtime because he had to come in at half six in the morning to open the building so that's information isn't it we know more than we did two seconds ago so the next question is well why does he come at ha in at half six when the school only starts operations at nine o'clock well he comes in at half six because one teacher likes to be in for seven o'clock so we've now got four sets more information than we started with in the process so we're opening up a school at half six for one person to come in at seven so we're starting heating it for seven o'clock to run through the day so we want to reduce costs we're now armed with knowledge and information to do that is one culture change to the person we want that person to no longer come in at seven and come in at eight o'clock with everybody else therefore we can bring the caretaker in later to his normal hours and not have to pay him overtime and second we don't have to have the heating on as early in the morning as we have been doing so two cost saving and that's a really really simple example of how to use information but one thing we'll discuss about information is there's two types of information and we've been demonstrate that example has demonstrated the two points we have quantitative information which is numbers figures which is a lot of what is stored on the computer and we have the other one that is not 100% disregarded by organizations because we do often use questionnaires but we need to find qualitative information 
So the first, the quantitative will tell us what's happening. So that's what that, that example did, wasn't it? And the qualitative, which we got from asking questions, will tell us why it is happening. So it goes back to our, a little bit similar to effective and efficient, isn't it? So we need to know what is happening, and that is all information gathering and what we talked about earlier about we can't manage what we can't measure, but then we need a different type of information as well, don't we, to find out why it's happening. And we refer to that as qualitative. We've got legislation as well. There's lots of legislation and as you know, within FM, we're constantly dealing with lots of acts of parts and everything. But the main ones, really, we need to think about how we store and handle information to make sure we're legally compliant. So we've got the basic ones, the Data Protection Act, the Freedom of Information Act, and then human rights. A lot of um, information covered in the Equality Act. Don't want to drill down into these too granular but you can you can go on the government websites and have a look at any of them we've got a new uh, data protection bill uh, that was running through at the moment so it's hoping to make the data protection laws fit in with the digital age and the sheer amount of data we have i think um, it, it's just impossible now to control some of that and empower people to take control of their own data I must admit, I, I'm not really aware of how much data there is about me and who has it, but I'm sure some of it's good and some of it's bad. Uh, support the businesses then and organisations through this change. And then the big one here, what are we going to do after we've left the EU? So that's kind of what this bill is going to focus on. So I did promise you a case study that would maybe work through some of the things we've talked about. This is actually somebody who did mention that they were going to attend this webinar, uh, sent an email through to see if we could we could help with this. So one of the things is it's another school. So this is this is their writing, not mine. I'm currently collecting energy data from my 17 primary schools. This is basically quantity of energy used in kilowatt per hours. OK, all of my 17 schools are different in size, meter squared, size per pupils and characteristics of construction. So that sounds like everybody's day-to-day -day problem. So there's nothing that's jumping out at us so far. Most are 1960s, so 70s mixed construction. Might have to explain to me what mixed construction is, but I presume you mean some are concrete frames, some are steam frames, some are masonry. Uh, one is 1904 solid brick two-story construction. Ooch. Another is an old Church of England school with original buildings from 1870s. How does one drill down into this data to understand energy usage and the reasons for what could appear excessive usage in some schools? Maybe maybe check what time people come in might be a start point, as, as my example before. What are the best benchmarking tools? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this open to everybody to have a little chip in with because I think this is is such a good uh, question. Uh, I wish I'd been able to think of it myself, actually, but there we go. I've put a couple of little things that I think there, but one of the first things I think you need to do is you need to consider that you're not comparing apples with apples at the moment. So kilowatt hours is basically for electricity. And obviously, you, I would imagine most of the schools will be heated with some form of gas. So therefore, we need to convert the language of gas and the language of electricity into one common area so we can measure across various schools. So the first point would be to make that conversion, which it tells you how to do that in SIBSI's TM46 and TM54. If you've not come across those before, um, SIBSI, the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers, they have various technical manuals and TM46 and TM54, I'd recommend any, everybody leads this webinar and tries to get a copy of that. I think we've spoken before about BIFM trying to make a copy of that available to people because it is a TM54 in particular is a really, really good way of anal analyzing how your building performs. But the first point of that, as I say, is to convert to uh, kilograms of CO2 per meter squared per annum. So now I'm going to throw the door open to, uh, to anybody else the door, the floor, open the floor to everybody else to see what their initial thoughts are, would be into how to solve this problem. And if when they come up, uh, Nicole, if you can shout them out, that'd be wonderful. 
yeah, no problem. So give people a few minutes to just go through. And oh, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're not going to work that out in <laughs> two seconds, are they? <laughs> and it was one we were discussing as well. Um, tricky, I have to say. Obviously, not from a technical background, um, I wouldn't be able to give any good answers. But, yeah, it's an interesting case study. It is probably one that we're not going to solve today. But if we, if we can if we can move it on one one step forward, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. So um, Schumann's come on and he said about um, looking at the trends in patterns and trying to figure those out. Uh, Sam said about normalizing um, by student numbers and or uh, M squared. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. That's probably where I would start, actually. Per pupil and per meter squared. I think. I think if you're doing that, though, I think you've got to look at are you comp are you comparing uh, the same building type because the same because different building types will have a different effect, won't they? And that's so. That's the point in this, isn't it? How far do you want to go into it? I think. What was the What was the gentleman's name who said that one? Sorry. That was Sam. Sam. Has Sam been a male or a female? We don't know, presumably. Um, <laughs> if, it, 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 would it, if, if you're male or female, I'll just say Sam. Anyway, great answer. And I think probably for the, I would think that that's the first starting point in this, isn't it? And see where we get. And then maybe try and find out a little bit more. But yeah, definitely meter squared and per pupil. Any other ones? So quite a few people have said about um, adding on to that uh, cost per pupil, cost per hour, and then per meter squared as well. Uh, so, so cost, yeah, per pupil. Uh, Jane has said about starting with a spreadsheet um, just to go through the types of business um, building, sorry, and uh, the capacity, etc. Right. Okay. Uh, Julian's come on and said about categorising uh, each building type and then using that data to benchmark against similar commercial benchmarking services. Yeah, that's one that I would certainly be coming down to further down the process. Yeah, that's a really good answer. Uh, Paul has raised a point. He said about um, the actual schools being in the same geographical area, um, if not temperature can vary um, depending on where they're located from town to town. They can. And the orientation of the school could, could make a difference as well, couldn't it? Uh, Simon said about carrying out heat loss calculations on the structure of each premises to determine oh, <laughs> yes, go on. To determine the energy demand over the a year to give you a baseline. Yeah, so so we could be we could be calculating heat gains and calculating the heat losses, couldn't we? So we could actually look into um, you know how many windows and what size are the windows in each building? I mean, this is how this is how much you can go into this if you really really want to find out stuff. So, anybody else got any other? They've all been brilliant so far, by the way. Um, I'm waiting for one that comes along and, and that I haven't thought of myself. That's the one that's going to get the apple today. Anything else? Uh, so Agnes has said it's making sure you put all the information in the database um, for each site so you can pull out your stats in various ways. Right, okay. Any others? So Peter said in terms of separating out which apples are apples and which are pears, might we start yeah. with cancel data on efficiency of buildings? Uh, some of the work may have been done in determining what energy grade a building has. Yeah. Yeah. What was the person's name who said that one? That was Peter. No, oh, right. Well, well done, Peter. Right. I'm going to. I'm going to. We, how long have we got left? I'm going to start with Peter, because I think the starting point. Obviously, if it's a school, uh, and I'm assuming then that it, that the uh, local authority schools, not a private school. The every building must have a display energy certificate mustn't it which is a similar thing to an energy performance certificate but is is based on the actual energy used so the first thing that we can do as peter rightly says is we can work out what 
the energy performance certificate would say so our notional building and we can have a look against our display energy certificate whether we are overperforming or underperforming so that kind of takes into account the type of building it is the number of occupants so that information means that you can compare the building with the building for want of a better way of putting it that's what a 1904 solid brick building should be performing at from an energy perspective if then we have a display energy certificate we can actually work out whether that is is correct so that's a that's a starting point then we can do the same with the 1960s buildings as well we might expect that different construction forms will have different problems um, and we can look at again u values and energy performance certificates and display energy certificates across that if then we have a large gap between what the notional building is as parcel describes it as and the actual energy usage is then we need to develop it further into why this is the case so i think somebody mentioned about calculating heat losses calculating heat gains so does one building open for longer might be something as simple as that isn't it should be very very simple does one different uh, one building have a different type of insulation does one building have a different number of windows or much larger windows if you think about windows in schools they've changed dramatically in size over the years again to reduce that amount of energy that's flowing out of the building conversely in the summer bigger windows will let more heat into the building so in the summer you've got the problem of solar gain and human load and electrical load all going on within the school if you think about a 1960s school 1960s school nobody was really using electrical equipment within the school it wasn't designed the only thing that was electrical in a classroom back then would have been the lights so you think now how that might differ and the different problem that that building is going to have so if we think about it is do we need so the next phase might be do we have enough information to know where our poor performance or our good performance is so if you think about a large school it would have lots of different sensors across different areas that would enable you to know what energy was being used and where so we'd have sensors that would be called temperatures we could have sensors that would be called energy use we'd have um balancing heat and cooling systems so we could have a sensor on a window slat that when the sensor realized that the building was at a certain temperature it would open the building to naturally cool it down so there's lots of things that could go on that we could simply monitor and help improve now the person doesn't say whether their their biggest energy use is electricity or whether it's gas so we can't break it down into what we think might be lighting plug load and maybe cooling if we've got aircon down to what might be gas as well so that's why i said you need to compare the two off the other thing to consider again is you know the age of the building can largely be helped by the epc which would be hugely hugely important in actually working out what those could be is whether you've got the money to uh, and the time to do that i think your benchmarking tools if you have a look at the carbon buzz website uh, what the carbon buzz does i don't know if any of the, the listeners have been on that but it enables you to go in and put your energy information from your school office whatever your type of organization is and it will then get stored in a central database and let you know against that database how you're performing and if you go and do that all the information that everybody said there about meters squared number of people construction type date of construction all that information is all what they ask and that will then crunch the numbers for you to give you some kind of benchmark but again as I, as i said right at the start in the example that i i knew i used you'll probably find that 
it's humans that have made or, or, or are using the building in a different way to what was the design was that's usually affected anything to do with poor performance in that. And as I said, a 1960s building has to now perform in a 21st century education setting. And that's quite difficult because it wasn't designed to do that. So the energy might provide you with the information about energy, but then if you use that information, it might provide you with knowledge to make qualitative decisions that we need to change this because this isn't fit for purpose, which is a which is taking the original question the case study much much further and using the information much further down the line uh does anybody anybody want to throw anything into that again I, we've got a couple of minutes we, we can anybody disagree with anything i've said anybody want to add anything to that hi Mel. i don't know if you can see this oh i've clicked off of it um but Peter i can't can Right. So Peter came in and he said, um, we're assuming also that the questioner wants to convert um, to um, kilograms, carbon dioxide, CO2, um, meters per squared by year. Uh, potentially, mm. they are literally after tracking and reducing just electric bills in buildings. In that case, I might start with commercially available electric electricity trackers, putting mm -hmm. one of Putting one of those into each site will give a baseline data of um, which site is using what electric at what time. And then comparing these might then provide odd data points, which we would then explain away with the quality of data. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And, and part of it could be a questionnaire with that, isn't it? You know, what, what, time, what time of the day the lights go on? Could you do an analysis on are there any passive infrared sensors that could help uh, bring it down? But you know, the first point, as Peter rightly says, is actually collating the information to then make future decisions, isn't it? Do we need passive infrareds? Do we need motion sensors? All these things could be brought into it. I mean, we don't know a lot about the building. We only know what we've got there, don't we? Also, um, Deborah added on to your um, human element earlier. Uh, she was saying about teacher behaviour. It may be they'd want to open a window rather than turn the radiator down. Yeah, and and that that's one of the biggest sins in every building, isn't it? Cooling and heating both working at the same time. Um, yeah, pet hate of mine, but there we go. Good point. Any others? Uh, so Ju Julian's mentioned degree day data. Yeah, I, I did. I didn't mention degree day data because I did. I, I, we're, might be a bit too much for this for this level but if people are, are, are well aware of it then yeah go for it yeah and and it would be something that would definitely be done i don't but i'm, I'm it, how long have we got left degree day data is far too complex to discuss one in an hour and certainly not in two minutes left <laughs> <laughs> But we could we could do one on we could do a webinar on degree day data if you wanted to. I don't know if there'd be any interest, but that would be something interesting to do. We'll look into it in future, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Chris okay. Oh, sorry. Go on. Uh, last one. Uh, Christine said about using thermostat controls, voltage optimizers, um, introducing LED lights to assist in reduction, uh, all those sort of things. Yeah, but again, they're they're kind of after we've found out that we need to make a reduction don't we we don't know whether we're at that point yet so we haven't we haven't got the info we might that might be the best performing 1904 solid brick school in the country might not we don't know yet do we we need to we need to find that out and that's that's part of the process probably will need to install all those things but we need to work out which ones we do need and where we need them don't we and that's what i think is this person's challenge at the moment anyway but all great stuff and thank can i just thank everybody for contributing to to the webinar because it's it's great to see the the level of information that, that you've that you've got the, the level of knowledge as well which is which is really really good so i've really i hope you've i hope you've enjoyed the hour as much as i have because i've i've had a great time listening to some of the ideas you've got so that's that's fantastic i'm going to flip over to my to my kind of last speaking slide so as remembered, the hardest part, and that's come out in the discussion, Evan, is, is deciding what it is you want to find out. Measuring and analysing after that is pretty 
straightforward, isn't it? There's not really too much to it. And remember the difference between quantitative information that will tell you what's happening and the qualitative, which will tell you why. So there are, are if you if you nothing else from today, go away with those two points. Uh, it's thanks from me and thank you for attending. And I'll, I don't know when I'm doing another one, but I look forward to talking to you again next time. And thank you for Nicole for being the, the master of ceremonies. Hello, thank you as well, Mel. Um, I don't know, I think the next slide's come up a bit funny. Uh, can you just flick back and across to it again? I don't know if it's just my screen. So it says thank you, and then go back to the CPD one. Uh, that's how it's... That's it. Oh, oh dear. That's how it's come up on mine. So um, I don't know. It, it, it looks like there's information underneath the slide, doesn't it? Uh, I could try and get it up on my end. Um, so anyone that wants to send in any questions just for the end of the webinar, um, do start yeah. typing those in. Um, while we're doing that, I am just going to open the last slide, my end, and release it. And it's just in regards to the um, CPD number for this webinar. Uh, so bear with me two seconds. Everybody. Oh, that's weird. I've done it on my one as well. How weird. It's yours the same, is it? Yeah, so no idea how that happened. Oh, well. There must have been a copy and paste job somewhere. Probably my end as well. Apologies for that. Uh, so let's just grab that quickly. Show my screen. From current slide. So. Anyone that wants to add this um, web webinar to their record, uh, the CPD number is 4504, and you can do that by logging into the BIFM website underneath your account. Um, just a bit of information on upcoming webinars. Uh, the next one is the BIFM Sustainability Survey 2017. Um, so that will be held on the 14th of November. Uh, just a bit of background on that. It's the 11th one we've done uh, for this year. It's supported by uh, British Gas and it's looking at current trends, um, how FMs are currently dealing with or planning to deal with sustainable issues. Uh, and then the next one will be on the GPG, uh, which is selecting FM software. So if um, you are in a stage maybe in relation to this webinar, looking at what databases you can use um, to actually help collect information and analyse it. Uh, then that might be a nice webinar for you to go on and that will be held on the 23rd of November. And then also uh, if anyone wants any face-to-face um, -face courses, uh, we've got the new BIFM Academy which has launched. Uh, the next series of courses coming up are listed there. So hopefully that's given you time to send in some questions. Uh, so let me just scroll up, bear me two seconds. So Sarah's asking if there's any speaker notes that can come along with this slide. Uh, I don't know if you've got any to hand, Mel, at all. Uh, notes? Uh, I, I don't. I don't make any notes. I just. It's all just, in your head. <laughs> just do it off. Do it off the top of my head as as I go along. I'm sorry. I, I, I know that, that that's probably not the answer you wanted, but yeah, I just. So I, if I did it tomorrow, it would be completely different. <laughs> we are recording it though, Sarah, so if there is any parts you want to go back and uh, make notes of yourself, then well, you can watch that. She, I was going to say, if Sarah wants to email me, she's, she's more than welcome to as well. Uh, yeah, I can send on information if that helps, Sarah. Let me know. Uh, other than that, the rest is all saying thank you, Mel, for the presentation. Oh, no, thank them. Again, the, you know, the, the, the level and standard of people's uh, comments has been excellent, so thank them. Okay, and then more thank yous are coming in. So, everyone, I hope you've enjoyed this webinar. Um, I know I have this end, um, especially with the interaction as well as Mel's presentation. And um, thank you, Mel, as well, for an excellent presentation. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, so we hope to see you on our next webinar. Um, until then, uh, goodbye as I say in the showbiz world. <laughs> <laughs> See ya, uh, bye. Bye-bye now.